and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. On this Sunday, when we celebrate the transfiguration of the Lord and also Valentine's Day, we are so glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning. We welcome longtime members, we welcome visitors, and although technology isn't always a blessing, it is a blessing when we can welcome those of you who are joining us via live stream this morning. So welcome those of you who are at home to those of us who are in the congregation. We welcome everyone here regardless of your age or stage of life, where you are on your faith journey. We are glad that you are here this morning to encounter God. This morning we have our first virtual coffee real fellowship time following our worship service at 1045. There are instructions on how you can log into this in the Friday highlights in the email that was sent out with worship information or also um, in our church bulletin. We hope you will join us, those of you who are at home, um, especially for some time of fellowship this morning. And, and this is again via Zoom. And speaking of Zoom, um, we have a congregational meeting this week via Zoom. On Thursday night at 7 p.m., we will have our annual congregation meet meeting. We will, hear, we will elect the 2021 nominating committee, hear reports from finance and stewardship and personnel committees. The Zoom doors will open at 6.50 p.m., and the Zoom link can be found in highlights and in the bulletin. Next week, Lent officially begins. Um, we have some discipleship opportunities for you during Lent. We will be sharing an electronic devotional, actually two of them, that will begin next Saturday. You'll receive those via email. And Will and I are also doing special studies during Lent. You see the information on the screen. I will be um, doing a study looking at the scriptures that we'll be looking at each week, digging deeper into those. And Will will be doing a study on the Lord's Prayer. Again, you can register for those on our website or through the um, highlights in the bulletin. And to begin Lent, we start with Ash Wednesday. And this year, we're doing Ash Wednesday just a little bit different, well, a lot different than we've done it before. We, in place of uh, evening service, we will be having drive-through in position of ashes at 8.30 a.m. and at 5.30 p.m., in the church car parking lot using COVID safe procedures. We'll also be doing a blessing. This is open to the community and we hope that you will share this information with your family, friends, and neighbors. This is an opportunity for us to start off Lent together in the community, recognizing um, it is from dust that we came and it is to dust that we go. So please join us. As a reminder, our music, prayer, scripture will be on the screen. You will be prompted at those times we wish for you to speak and join in those prayers. We do ask that you keep your masks on during the service. And as a reminder, um, we're asking you not to belt out the music like Broadway show tunes, but to sing it in your heart or quietly under your mask. So let us turn ourselves to God as we call ourselves to worship on this Transfiguration Sunday. I invite you to speak aloud the words of all that are on the screen. On a high mountain, Jesus was transfigured, and God said to him, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. May we be transfigured in our worship by listening to Jesus, the music prayers, scripture, and sermon. Let us continue to worship as we praise ye the Lord the Almighty.
alone is righteous. God alone is perfect. God alone is judge. Yet this holy and righteous God comes to us in love to save us. Rejoicing in God's grace, let us confess our sin. Please join your voices with mine. God of transfiguration, you are with us in the mountaintops and in the valleys of life. Yet we are sometimes blind to your presence. We lose sight of you and our dependence on you. When Christ calls us to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, house the homeless, and help the poor, we often don't listen as we should. Forgive us and help us by your spirit to live transfigured lives of love, justice, peace, and service in Christ's name. Let us hear our plea to God as sung by our choir. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Amen. Friends, our God comes and does not keep silent. God speaks to us with grace and love, saying, You are my beloved child. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. We've just been assured that we are forgiven. We've just been assured that we are new creations in Christ our Lord. Listen to this Old Testament story that reminds us to live as new creations in Christ by not listening to the voice of sin. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with Joseph and that the Lord caused all that Joseph did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all he had, in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And with Joseph there, he had no concern but the food that he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and good-looking, and after a time... His master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But Joseph refused 
and said to his master's wife, Look, with me here, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything back from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, Joseph would not consent to lie beside her or to be with her. <clears throat> Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our hearts in prayer. God, we need you, especially in these divisive, stressful, and unsettling days. By your Spirit, empty us now of our to-do lists and other distracting thoughts and fill us full of your love and life-transforming word. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Jonathan Sachs died in November of last year. Sachs was the former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom. I read his book, Lessons in Leadership, with a group of pastors in Virginia when I was serving as a pastor there. That book explores selected stories in the Torah to unearth what those stories teach us about leadership. The Torah is the first five books of the Hebrew Bible and our Old Testament. It, one chapter in Sachs' book explores a special written notation in Hebrew texts of the Torah. That special written notation is called a shalshalet. As you can see on the screen, a shalshalet is a squiggly mark written above a Hebrew word. Shalshalets are rare in the Torah, in those first five books of the Old Testament. There are only four of those shalshalets in those first five books of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. Three of the four shalshalets are in the book of Genesis, and the fourth is in the book of Leviticus. Sachs explains that each shalshalet each squiggly mark written above a Hebrew word signals to us an existential crisis or a decisive moment in that story. The Shalshalet then is there to grab the reader's attention. It declares to the reader, stop, pay attention to what is happening right here in this story. One of the four shalshalets in the entire Old Testament is in today's story. Before I say where it is in today's story, first recall the background of today's story. Joseph's own brothers have sold Joseph as a slave in Egypt to the Ishmaelites. At the time of today's story, though, as we read, he was bought by an Egyptian. And Joseph is working for him, for Potiphar, a prominent offer of Pharaoh, the Egyptian king. Potiphar sees that, jo that God is with Joseph, as we read. So he places his trust in Joseph and puts Joseph in charge of his house and everything that Potiphar owns. As we read, Joseph was handsome and good-looking. So, Joseph, before you know it, Potiphar's wife 
has eyes for him. She begs Joseph, sleep with me. But Joseph refused. I can't do that. Your husband has put me in charge of everything except you. You are his wife. That would be wrong. I can't sin against God. In the Hebrew of this story, the shall shalet is written above the Hebrew word translated, he refused. Stop. Pay attention to what's happening right here in this story. But what is happening? What decisive moment is the shall shalet signaling to us here? <clears throat> the answer of rabbinic sources and Jewish commentaries is that Joseph nearly succumbs here. He thought about not refusing her, that only with considerable effort is Joseph able to say no to Potiphar's wife at that point in the story. It's as if at that decisive moment, Joseph is tempted to say yes. Imagine this shall shall let moment as if it were a scene in a movie. After Potiphar's wife urges him, sleep with me, the action enters slow motion. The camera focuses in on Joseph's face. His eyes betray the temptation to give in. Then the slow motion ends. Joseph's eyes narrow, his jaw sets, and he launches into his rejection of her advance. Joseph doesn't give in. He doesn't sin. But that isn't all. Sachs observes, this is more than the usual conflict between temptation and sin. It is a conflict of identity. Sachs explains, recall that Joseph is now living in, for him, a new and strange land. His brothers have rejected him. They have made it clear that they did not want him as part of their family. When, why then, should Joseph not, in Egypt, do as the Egyptians do? Why not just yield to his master's wife if that is what she wants? Sachs adds, the question for Joseph here is not just, is this right? The question also is, am I an Egyptian or a Jew? It is a question of identity. Joseph's decisive moment, his shall shall let moment here in this story then, is an I check, an identity check. It's not just a question about sinning or not sinning. It's a question about who Joseph is. It is a question about his identity. If he succumbs to her advances, he eschews his identity as a Jew faithful to God. I think of Joshua's words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For Joseph, then, it is an ID check. Like Joseph, we have ID checks in our own lives too, don't we? When we are tempted to sin, when we are tempted not to do what's right in God's eyes, because for us, too, it is not just a question about sinning or not sinning. It is a question about who we are, a question of our identity as Christians. And our identity as Christians is that we are new creations in Christ. The Apostle Paul declares this, and we often hear it at the time of the confession in our worship services. The Apostle Paul declares if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. 
Behold, everything has become new. So, we are created in the image of God, and we are recreated in the image of Christ. We are new creations in him. Elsewhere in his letters, Paul uses the language of new self, which he contrasts with our old self. By the power of the Spirit, not on our own, but by the power of the Spirit in us, we are a new self in Christ. So we do not have to listen to sin. It is not our master. Christ is. So, in our daily decisive moments, when we resist forgiving someone, when we're poised to get even rather than turn the other cheek, when we're reluctant to apologize and work to reconcile, when we're prepared to curse our enemies instead of bless them and pray for them. Indeed, whenever a figurative shalshalet hangs above us and signals to us, stop, pay attention to what is happening right here in your life. The question for us is not just, is this right? The question for us is, am I a new creation in Christ? Or am I an old self of sin? I D check. Eustace Scrub is a character in C.S. Lewis's book, The Dawn Treader. It's one of the books in Lewis's classic Chronicles of Narnia series. Eustace in this book is an insufferable boy. He's rude and insulting. He's jealous and quarrelsome. He's unhelpful and unkind. He's a bully. At decisive moments in his young life, Eustace did what was wrong. We could say that he lived as an old self of sin. Eustace is an old self of sin, so much so that he turns into a dragon. A dreaded dragon becomes his identity. C.S. Lewis was a Christian, and a dragon is Lewis's depiction of those like Eustace living as old selves of sin. But there is hope. Hope for Eustace and hope for people like him. Because one night, Eustace hears Aslan calling him. Aslan is a lion. In the Chronicles of Narnia series, Aslan represents Christ, the lion of Judah. Aslan says to Eustace, follow me, echoing our Savior's own call to us in our own lives. Following Aslan, Eustace is led to a pool of water. Aslan tells Eustace that Eustace must first undress himself, scratching and clawing himself. Eustace, the dragon, remember, desperately tries to shed his scales like a snake skin. After attempting to do this three times, Eustace begins to think that he'd never rid himself of those dreaded scales of his identity as a dragon. Aslan then tells Eustace, you will have to let me undress you. Then Aslan begins to tear the scales from Eustace and then picks him up and drops him into the pool of water. As Eustace is washed, he turns back into a boy a much better-natured boy. We would say a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Behold, everything has become new. Baptized in that pool of water, 
Eustace is now a new creation. And that is our identity as Christians. So, in our daily decisive moments, when we are tempted to sin, to not do what is right in God's eyes, whenever a figurative shall shall let above us signals to us, stop, pay attention to what is occurring right here in your life. The question for us is not just, is this right? The question is, will I be an old self of sin or will I be the new creation in Christ that I am by the power of the Holy Spirit? I D check. Alleluia. Amen. Please pray with me. Ever-present God, through your spirit, help us to just say no to sin. Yes, whenever a figurative shalshalet above us says, stop, pay attention to what's happening right here. Help us not to live as an old self of sin, because that's not our true identity. Instead, through your spirit, help us to live as the new creations in Christ that we are. Amen. Please join me as we come to our God in prayer. O Lord, we praise you because you are great, glorious, majestic, awesome, and holy. You created all that is. You have been working for your great plan since the beginning of time. You are also gracious, compassionate, and trustworthy. 
You provide for us. You provide our food, our shelter, and you provide our redemption. All that we have is from you. Remind us frequently, Lord, to ponder these things. Gratitude for all that we have is the beginning of wisdom and the source of joy. But so often the things we ponder are our own worries, our losses, our disappointments, and our to-do lists. Father, will you help us to retrain our minds, to meditate on you and on the good works that you have done since the creation of the world and are still doing today? Fix our eyes on who you are and all that you do. And as we do so, may we experience the freedom from our anxieties and griefs and the joy and peace that come from a heart that trusts in your faithfulness. Lord, we are thankful that you are our sovereign over nations, healer of diseases, rebuilder of the broken. May we see you at work bringing healing to our nation, our world, our relationships, and our hearts. I pray for the division in our country, as well as for those experiencing division in their own homes, for those stressed by hard decisions in the face of the pandemic or other life circumstances, be their wisdom and joy. For all of the frontline workers who daily strive to heal and protect, help them see your light at the end of the tunnel and continue to pursue their vital missions. As your beloved, we yearn to be a loving people, a people who are known by our love of God and our love of neighbor. As such, we come alongside those that we know to be in need. We grieve with those who grieve, especially those who have recently experienced loss, including Pastor Will and his family as they mourn the loss of Kate's father. For all families who face the darkness of emptiness and sadness, surround and fill them with your loving light of comfort and hope. Enrich their lives with joyful memories and friendship encircled by your love. Heavenly Father, source of life and love, we look to you not only as our great example, but also as our constant companion. Lord, I pray you will unlock our hearts that we might be fully alive to our true identities in you. Give us clear revelation to see ourselves the way you see us and give us the determination and courage to live your truth in our lives every day. We pray that you prepare us to be the kind of united and uniting church that you call us to be so that we might draw others into the life of your son who taught us to pray saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I thank God for Jane Jude, who just prayed, and for her prayer. Prayer is what helps us to live as the new creations in Christ that we are. And to live as new creations in Christ is to give. To give of our time and our talents and our treasures. Though the ushers won't be collecting our treasures today, we invite you to place yours in the boxes that are on the walls that you will see as you leave here today. And for those who are joining us by live stream or those who are here who aren't able to do that or prepared to do that today, you can also give through the Give button at the top of our website or by text or by mailing a check here to the church, the good old-fashioned way. We will accept that, too. Grateful 
to be new creations who know the power of giving in our lives. Let us pause to thank God in a moment of gratitude. Please join me in prayer. God of love, thank you for opportunities to give, to give back some of what you have so generously given to us. Use it, we pray, so people in this church and everywhere will know you and your love in their lives. In the name of your Son, our Lord, we pray, amen. Let us now join our hearts in song.
Amen. Before we leave, inspired anew to live as the new creations we are in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I do remind you that the ushers will dismiss you from the back to the front. As we just sang, yes, the Lord is our freedom song. He freed us from the power of sin. He has freed us to live as the new creations in Christ that we are. So, especially on this Valentine's Day, this Transfiguration Sunday, let us do that and go in love. And all of God's people said, Amen.